The space community awaits a decision about Artemis. A lovely cosmic tarantula has been captured by the Webb telescope, and new plasma tech could generate oxygen on Mars. That and more on today's edition of WSN Space Newscast. Greetings! Our just wonderful space telescope brings us another beautiful image today. Thousands of never-before-seen young stars are spotted in a stellar nursery called 30 Doratus, nicknamed the Tarantula Nebula for the appearance of its dusty filaments. The nebula has long been a favorite for astronomers studying star formation. In addition to young stars, Webb reveals distant background galaxies, as well as the detailed structure and composition of the nebula's gas and dust. At only 161,000 light years away in the Large Magellanic Cloud Galaxy, the Tarantula Nebula is the largest and brightest star forming region in the local group, the galaxies nearest to our Milky Way. It is home to the hottest, most massive stars known. Astronomers focused three of Webb's high resolution infrared instruments on the Tarantula. Viewed with the near-infrared camera, NearCam, the region resembles a burrowing tarantula's home lined with its silk. The nebula's cavity, centered in the NearCam image, has been hollowed out by blistering radiation from a cluster of massive young stars which sparkle pale blue in the image. Only the densest surrounding areas of the nebula resist erosion by these stars powerful stellar winds, forming pillars that appear to point back toward the cluster. These pillars contain forming protostars, which will eventually emerge from their dusty cocoons and take their turn shaping the nebula. Webb's near-infrared spectrograph, NearSpec, caught one very young star doing just that. Astronomers previously thought this star might be a bit older, and already in the process of clearing out a bubble around itself. However, NearSpec showed that the star was only just beginning to emerge from its pillar and still maintained an insulating cloud of dust around itself. Without Webb's high-resolution spectra at infrared wavelengths, this episode of star formation in action could not have been revealed. The region takes on a different appearance when viewed in the longer infrared wavelengths detected by Webb's mid-infrared instrument, or MIRI. The hot stars fade and the cooler stars and dust glow. Within the stellar nursery clouds, points of light indicate embedded protostars still gaining mass. While shorter wavelengths of light are absorbed or scattered by dust grains in the nebula, and therefore never reach Webb to be detected, longer mid-infrared wavelengths penetrate that dust ultimately revealing a previously unseen cosmic environment. One of the reasons the Tarantula Nebula is so interesting to astronomers is that the nebula has a similar type of chemical composition as the gigantic star-forming regions observed at the universe's cosmic noon, when the cosmos was only a few billion years old and star formation was at its peak. Star-forming regions in our Milky Way galaxy are not producing stars at the same furious rate as the Tarantula Nebula and have a different chemical composition. This makes the Tarantula the closest example of what was happening in the universe as it reached its brilliant high noon. Webb will provide astronomers the opportunity to compare and contrast observations of star formation and the Tarantula Nebula, with the telescope's deep observations of distant galaxies from the actual era of cosmic noon. Despite humanity's thousands of years of stargazing, the star formation process still holds many mysteries, many of them due to our previous inability to get crisp images of what was happening behind the thick clouds of stellar nurseries. 
Webb has already begun revealing a universe never seen before and is only getting started on rewriting the stellar creation story. A side-by-side -side display of the same region of the Tarantula Nebula brings out the distinctions between Webb's near-infrared, closer to visible red on the left, and mid-infrared, further from visible red on the right, images. Each portion of the electromagnetic spectrum reveals and conceals different features, making data in different wavelengths valuable to astronomers for understanding the physics taking place. The image captured by Webb's near-infrared camera features bright hot features like the sparkling cluster of massive young stars and the bright star to their upper left, featuring Webb's distinctive diffraction spikes. Young emerging stars shine blue, while scattered red points indicate stars that are still enshrouded in dust. Structure in the nebula carved by the stellar winds of the massive young stars is intricately detailed. In the view from Webb's Miri, the hot young stars fade and cooler gas takes the spotlight. Much of the nebula takes on a ghostly appearance in the mid-infrared because these longer wavelengths of light are able to penetrate the dust clouds and reach Webb. Previously hidden bubbles and dust-embedded stars emerge, a particularly prominent spherically shaped bubble being blown out by a newborn star appears in the Miri image just to the right of the now darkened central star cluster. Another difference between the two images is the appearance of the bright lone star at the top of the nebula's cavity. In the Miri image on the right, the star is fainter relative to the surrounding nebula, so the glare and the distortion of Webb's diffraction spikes are much less prominent. In the midst of the central cluster of young stars, one dense gas clump is clearly visible in both images. It is one of the last dense remnants of the nebula that the young cluster star stellar winds have not yet eroded away. Webb's near-infrared spectrograph, NearSpec, reveals what is really going on in an intriguing region of the Tarantula Nebula. Astronomers focused the powerful instrument on what looked like a small bubble feature in the image from NearCam. However, the spectra reveal a very different picture from a young star blowing a bubble in its surrounding gas. The signature of atomic hydrogen, shown in blue, shows up in the star itself, but not in the immediate surrounding area. Instead, it appears outside the bubble, which spectra show is actually filled with molecular hydrogen, green, and complex hydrocarbons, red. This indicates that the bubble is actually the top of a dense pillar of dust and gas that is being blasted by radiation from the cluster of massive young stars to its lower right. It does not appear as pillar-like as some other structures in the nebula because there is not much color contrast with the area surrounding it. The harsh stellar wind from the massive young stars in the nebula is breaking apart molecules outside the pillar, but inside they are preserved, forming a cushy cocoon for the star. The star is still young to be too young to be clearing out its surroundings by blowing bubbles. Nearspec has captured it just beginning to emerge from the protective cloud from which it was formed. Without Webb's resolution at infrared wavelengths, the discovery of this star's birth in action could not have been possible. When it comes to making oxygen on Mars, the technology used by MOXIE in its successful test runs may not be the only game in town. An international team of researchers has developed a complementary approach that uses plasma to produce and separate oxygen. It may deliver high rates of oxygen molecule production and could help make feedstock and base chemicals needed for fuels, fertilizers, and building materials. Researchers from MIT, the University of Lisbon, and institutions in France and the Netherlands participated in the study. They report that conditions are favorable for in situ resource utilization by plasmas, as atmospheric carbon dioxide can be split to produce oxygen, and the pressure of the atmosphere is favorable for plasma ignition. 
South Korea's exciting lunar orbiter, Denuri, successfully conducted a critical trajectory correction burn on September 2nd, allowing the Korean Aerospace Research Institute to forego another burn later this month. The lengthy but propellant-efficient path to the moon will see another burn in November, with capture in the moon's orbit on December 16th. Plans call for Denuri to begin operations in January from a 100-kilometer orbit. Chinese telecommunications company Huawei has announced that its new Mate 50 smartphone will receive communications through China's Baidou navigation satellites. It will reportedly allow users to send short texts and map travel routes. American sanctions against the firm prevent them from using current 5G chips and the Android operating system, severely crippling their product line and drastically cutting their smartphone sales. Tomorrow's Apple event extravaganza may feature a reveal of iPhone satellite connectivity. The next Falcon 9 Starlink launch is set for Saturday. Like the last launch, it will have a hitchhiker, competitor AST Space Mobile's Blue Walker 3 broadband to phone satellite. Launch from KSC's historic Pad 39A is planned for 7.51 p.m. Eastern. A brand new rocket from ABL Space, the RS-1, could make its debut launch on Saturday from the Alaska Pacific Spaceport Complex. And keeping the weekend busy, Firefly Aerospace's Alpha test rocket could lift off around 6 p.m. Eastern on Sunday from the Vandenberg Space Force Base. Somebody on Twitter has opened an account to tease Artemis manager Mike Serafin about his mustache. It'll be interesting to see how this person manages to find funny things to tweet about. For your Wednesday, it's National Salami Day. And that's the way space is today. Until tomorrow, add in Explorata toward the unknown in the measureless arena of space. Stay tough and competent, and thanks for watching. Wall Street was down modestly on Tuesday with the NASDAQ down seven-tenths of a percent. Fifteen of our 28 tracked space shares were up, with Black Sky Technology and Virgin Orbit racking up the biggest gains. Astrotech was the biggest loser, dropping about 7% in value. Reporting from Cyberspace, this is correspondent Karen Calvis.